Now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. A couple of weeks ago, I held a forum for women entrepreneurs in Beaches, East York, because the East End of Toronto has an unusually high number of women entrepreneurs. Shout out to Colin Johnson and the Danny BIA for that research. And because it's been widely recognized that the pandemic has caused a she session, the smart, innovative, creative women who came together to support one another and look for solutions had a lot to say about what they need most. Revenue is down, expenses are up, they need rent relief and they need it right away. What they don't need is this government boasting that red tape reduction is a plan for a she recovery. Today, they need cash in hand from a government that cares. They need a ban on commercial evictions through the end of the pandemic. They also need the government to make transparent, evidence-based decisions. Small businesses that were asked to close on October 9 don't understand why they are seen as more dangerous than crowded classrooms or crammed buses where people are told to take their chances. Dance studios that were closed have now been reopened by tweet. But what about yoga studios or small gyms that have spent thousands of dollars putting up barriers and have strict protocols in place? We should be rewarding small businesses that have made investments in safety rather than shutting them arbitrarily. We need evidence-based, transparent decision-making from this government. Small businesses in Beaches East York and in Ontario deserve so much better. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This month, we celebrate Persons Day, which marks the anniversary of the legal ruling that under the Canadian Constitution, women were able to uh, be included as qualified persons and could sit in the Senate. The Famous Five is a very important story for my riding. After all, Amy Murphy, who had appealed to the Canadian Supreme Court, was from uh, from Cookstown, which is situated in Innisfil. And Innisfil has a proud legacy of women of influence. In fact, this year, our, our mayor, Lynn Dolan, won the 2020 Women of Influence Award by Municipal World. And it goes further, Mr. Speaker, as you may know, Deputy Chief McCleary Downer, who first started her career in policing with the OPP in 1981. She served there uh, in, her, in, several, uh, in several, several capabilities, including in 1992 when she, was, she made history, becoming the first woman to serve as a detachment commander in the rank of staff sergeant in Port Credit. And later, she came to serve in 2017 at South Simcoe Police and was the first female deputy police officer for South Simcoe Police. And now, as you may know, she did serve as the aide-de-camp for the lieutenant governor uh, here at the Ontario Legislature. She served served there for different lieutenant governors since 2002, and as of this month, she has been named the chief uh, aide-de-camp. So I'm very proud of her. Congratulations. And uh, it's pr I'm very proud to represent a riding that has so much history for progressing women forward. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Niagara Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to tell you about one of the forgotten casualties of the ongoing pandemic cultural clubs and associations, and the facilities and banquet halls they operate. Cultural facilities in my riding and across the province provide a measurable value to our communities and are integrated into their social fabric. They do everything from supporting seniors and youth to welcoming newcomers to raising money for food banks and other charities. Yet many are facing closure due to unprecedented fiscal constraints with no end in sight. Club Capri is an Italian hall in my Thorold neighbourhood Formed in 1917 by a group of volunteers, the association opened their hall in 1960. This club has been hosting wedding receptions, fundraisers, and other community functions ever since. Due to the pandemic, they've had to close up shop, losing over 50% of their revenue as a result. They've lost nearly a quarter of a million dollars. In August, Club Capri applied for a Trillium grant and has yet to hear back. Without interve intervention, this cultural hall that has been operating for over a century is facing imminent closure. Speaker, Club Capri is just one example of many cultural halls and not-for-profits across Ontario on the brink of collapse. Make no mistake, the economic recovery of our province depends on the not-for-profit sector being able to continue, to continue to operate. Investment in cultural infrastructure is essential for the health, well-being, and economic prosperity of communities. We must invest in these community hubs now or pay a much higher price for the fallout when we lose them. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Eglinton-Lawrence. 
Thank you, Speaker. I rise today in the House to express my deep sorrow as yet another death as a result of gun violence has occurred in my riding. Shane Stanford, 33, was killed on October 7. This young man was a part of the health and fitness team at the Central YMCA just close here to Queen's Park and had headed home after locking up the facility when someone drove by him in another car and opened fire. It was about 11.30 in the evening. Moments after the gunfire, his car unfortunately crashed into the side of a local home, and he was pronounced dead at the scene and was Toronto's 58th homicide victim of the year. On last Wednesday, October 14th, dozens of people attended a candlelight vigil in the community in honour of this fitness instructor. This young man worked with youth in the community and improved kids' lives, and it's very important uh, to have people like him there. A longtime friend of his reported that he was one of those kids who looked up to Stanford. And Stanford had a family and friends who loved him, and one of them said he had a beautiful soul. Indeed, every life is precious, and Stanford's was treasured by his family and his community who are struggling to come to terms with his untimely death. In the aftermath of this tragedy, I have re-engaged in conversations with community leaders about what else we can do and will continue to engage with them in the coming days. This tragic violence has to stop. Member Statements, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to rise in the House today to speak once again about Abigail Lobsinger. Many people will remember Abigail's, who is Waterloo's toughest cookie. She has been fighting neuroblastoma, a rare and aggressive form of childhood cancer, for five years, most of her young life. Abigail is remarkably strong and has had, had the support of her amazing and resilient family every step of the way. As part of her treatment, she has been receiving transfusions of blood and platelets these days on a weekly basis. For Abigail and her family, these transfusions are life-sustaining. Their significance cannot be underestimated. Abigail's experience highlights the need for constant blood donations from those who can give. According to the Canadian Cancer Society, over 900 Canadian children are diagnosed with cancer each year. As part of their treatment, many of these kids require blood, plasma, or platelet transfusions. These children, kids like Abigail, need all of us who are able to step forward and donate blood. Canadian Blood Services has gone above and beyond to make sure that all safety protocols are in place to ensure that people like you and I can continue to safely donate. Donors are always needed. Please, if you are able, book an appointment online at blood.ca. On behalf of all of Waterloo, we are sending our love and our positive energy to Waterloo's toughest cookie. Member Statements, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sylvia Lusgarden is a spunky 94-year-old who insists on being heard. She has adapted to using Zoom conferencing during this pandemic and is managing quite well to keep up with her family and friends and interests. In fact, she's coping so well she's part of a committee to develop an international film festival on ageism. Silver Scenes is a unique film festival that celebrates the older adult in all their complexity. Ageism is one of the final prejudices that is still socially acceptable. It's deeply ingrained in, with economic, psychological, social, and cultural factors that prevent its eradic eradication. And this film festival's goal is to use films as catalysts to provoke discussions. Silver Scenes is honoring Alana Nice, Obama Sin Sawin, an Indigenous woman from the Abenaki tribe who is an 88-year-old filmmaker still making feature-length documentaries, and she just won the Glenn Gould Award, so congratulations, Ala Nice. The festival will be highlighting three Ontario-made productions, including The Cuban, The Art of Downsizing, A Hundred and Counting, and of course, a classic film from 1971, Harold and Maude, which is a romantic, about a romantic relationship uh, of a young man with a 79-year-old woman who's a Nazi concentration camp survivor, and she teaches Harold about living life to its fullest and that life is the most precious gift of all. Certainly an important lesson for film lovers of all ages. So this is free. Sign up at silverscenes.org, and we're all looking forward to participating. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the weekend, government members took to social media to encourage constituents to get their flu shots, while also sharing how easily they have been able to get theirs. 
talk about privilege. Mr. Speaker, do they not realize that people in Scarborough and across the province are being turned away from pharmacies due to the extreme shortage of flu shots? Yesterday, during question period, we've heard the Minister of Health say, and I quote, we do not have shortages, but I'm hearing otherwise. And I know members of the government side are also hearing otherwise. This government was fully aware that this may happen, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's population is approximately 14.5 million, and uh, yet this government has only ordered 5.1 million flu shots. I have constituents who have had to wait six hours at Shoppers Drug Mart only to be turned away after being told that there is no stock left. I had a senior constituent, Mr. Speaker, who shared with me how worried he is about the unavailability of the high dose, dose vaccine. Upon reaching out to his doctor and several pharmacies, he was told that, and I quote, that it disappears the same day they get it. Across my constituency office in Cliffcrest, the Shoppers Drug Mart had a sign that said, and I quote, our store has run out of the flu vaccine, and this was put up, which I have had to actually shared with the minister and the premier as well. Mr. Speaker, we know that this is a big task, but we also know that the people should not have to wait a long, that long to get a flu shot. This government needs to be open with the public that they were not prepared for the second wave. Ontarians should not be caught in this mess just to be safe in this province. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to voice the concerns of businesses in my riding of Ottawa Vanier, but also across the province. With businesses going in the, to a second round of lockdown, many won't be able to make up for the lost revenue and will have to close door permanently. These closures were announced without any kind of warning, and we have yet to see the supporting data that shows transmission through businesses in Ottawa. Businesses such as restaurants, bingo halls that raise money for charities, health and fitness facilities, for example, have shown that they care about their community because they've put in place all the required public health measures to protect the community. Many are questioning right now the recent restrictions. Health and fitness centers also provide care for the mind through their services, and we are starting to see alarming signs of the negative consequences of the closures. In Ottawa and in my riding, people have demonstrated incredible support for small and medium-sized businesses for the future of our local economy, but it cannot be put, we cannot rely for them to bear the whole weight of this. The proposed one-time grant of up to $1,000 for selected businesses to offset, offset the cost of PPE is clearly not a meaningful help if you have to shut down. I urge the government to act now and provide real support before we lose the local businesses that make up the backbone of our local economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next statement, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was proud to have both the Premier and the Minister of Government and Consumer Services in my riding of Milton recently to visit the team at DSV Global Transport and Logistics. Uh, I knew when I toured the DSV facility in my riding about a year ago during construction that this facility was going to play a huge role in Ontario's overall supply chain. But with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, DSV has played a huge role in making sure Ontarians stay safe and fully supplied with personal protective equipment. Thanks to the tireless efforts of the DSV team, 42 million units of non-medical grade PPE have come directly from Milton in August alone. That is over 12 full tractor trailers a day, Mr. Speaker, with 50 to 60 people picking and packing orders 24 hours a day their teams are making sure PPE supplies are always available to those in need. That means more masks, more face shields, more cleaning supplies, sanitizers and gloves are being sent to help our schools and other institutions stay safe. I want to thank the team at the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services for being hands-on in the facility to ensure a timely turnaround of PPE while ensuring there are no corners cut 
when it comes to quality control. Thanks to the work being done in Milton, our PPE supply chains remain strong, helping those Ontarians stay healthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to express how pleased I am that the e-commerce giant Amazon has chosen Hamilton as the site for a new 855,000 square foot fulfillment centre. The investment will create 1,500 full-time jobs and competitive hourly wages and benefits and is expected to open next year. Employees at the warehouse will work with robotics to pick, pack and ship small items such as books, electronics and toys. The items will be sent from the fulfillment centre to a delivery station in Stony Creek where cargo vans will ship the products to customers. Mr. Speaker, this investment will bring the number of Amazon fulfillment centres in Ontario now to 10. The facility is being constructed in a major business park near the Hamilton Airport in my riding of Flamborough-Glanbrook. Flamborough-Glanbrook has seen unprecedented economic growth in the past few years. Last year, German-based logistic giant DHL announced it is expanding its gateway into Canada with a new $100 million distribution centre at the Hamilton Airport. The airport offers benefits to companies like DHL and Amazon that need to meet growing demands in handling capacity. Amazon's investment in Hamilton is further evidence that business has confidence in Ontario's future. Our government, led by the Premier, has worked tirelessly to chart a path to economic recovery and to get people back to work. Thank you. And that concludes our member statements for this morning.